Okay, so today I'm gonna, going to explore what it means to be unworthy from a Christian perspective and how it is that in recognizing and, and accepting our unworthiness is actually a great gift. But first I wanna say a few words about the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John reminds me of a song. It's a song from Sesame Street. Maybe you've heard it before. It's called, One of These Things is Not Like the Others. As you can probably imagine on Sesame Street when the song is playing, the kids watching are supposed to look at the pictures and determine which, which one is not like the others. And the Gospel of John is kind of like the cat in this picture. It's quite a bit different from the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. These first three books of the New Testament are called the Synoptic Gospels, and they have a lot in common. Of course, they do have their share of differences, but when you see them next to the Gospel of John, John is definitely the one that is not like the others. Why are the synoptics so similar? Well, the authors had access to many of the same sources. In fact, many scholars believe that Mark was actually written first, even though it's the second Gospel in the New Testament. Um, they believe that it was written first and that Ma the authors of Matthew and Luke used Mark when they were composing their Gospels. Um, they also think there was another document, which they just call Q, um, that they also used. So that document's never actually been found, but they theorize that they also had this other document. So they used the Gospel of Mark and Q to write their um, accounts. But even so, there are some differences in the details of these accounts. But then there's John, which is believed to be the last gospel written, and it doesn't appear that the author of John had access to the other gospels. And in today's passage from John, we see that the story of how Andrew and Peter became disciples of Jesus is very different than in the synoptics. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all share the well-known image of Andrew and Peter fishing in the Sea of Galilee. Matthew and Mark's accounts are nearly identical, with Andrew and Peter casting their nets into the sea when Jesus walked by and tells them to follow him and he would make them fishers, fish for people. So they did. Luke has a similar story with the addition of Jesus telling Andrew and Peter to cast their nets even though they had gone all night without catching anything. They cast their nets and caught so many fish that the boat began to sink. Then Jesus said, follow me, and you will fish for people. But I just read for you a much different account in the Gospel of John. But before we get into that, I want to explore whether these differences among the Gospels are a cause for concern. The first time I learned several years ago how different the Gospels are, it kind of freaked me out. I'd never really sat down and compared them before side by side, but I found myself on a website whose purpose was to discredit Christianity. There are some voices in the world that try to make God and faith seem anti-intellectual and irrelevant for living in the world. They cast religion as the main reason that we have all the violence in the world and why we can't all get along and they say we would be better off without religion. Wading through this nonsense, which at the time didn't seem like nonsense, was part of my faith journey. So do these differences in the gospel accounts discredit Christianity? After all, if this is the inspired word of God, the gospel should all agree, right? Well, no. I would argue that the inclusion in the canon of four different gospels gospel accounts that differ here and there but cor corroborate each other on the major Christian theological points actually adds credibility to the accounts. After all, the people who put the canon together obviously were smart enough to know there were differences in the accounts they were putting together. It's not some discovery that has just recently come to life. So if they knew about the discrepancies and still chose to include them side by side, they must not have thought that these differences were a problem. And there must have been a purpose to including four accounts of Jesus' life instead of just one. Each author was writing to a particular audience and had his own particular focus and theological points to make. Additionally, the Gospels fit into the genre of ancient biography, which is different than our modern notions of biography. They are not the same. 
and we should not impose our modern expectations onto these ancient texts. They fit within the expectations for um, ancient biographies back then. If you would like to learn more about this topic, there are some book recommendations for you. Um, if you would like the names of these books, you can talk to me after the service and I can give them to you. So let's get back to our scripture passage for today. As I reflected on this passage, two verses jumped out at me. It is in John's Gospel that we become aware that before they became Jesus' disciples, Andrew and probably Peter were first John the Baptist's disciples. When John the Baptist announces that Jesus is the Lamb of God, the two disciples standing with John, Andrew, and an unnamed person, leave him at the drop of a hat, say, See ya, John, and go to follow Jesus instead. Then Andrew finds his brother Peter and brings him to Jesus too. John's Gospel gives the most attention to the role of John the Baptist of any of the Gospels. In fact, in the other Gospels, John the Baptist was reportedly already in prison uh, at the time that Andrew and Peter became disciples of Jesus while fishing on the Sea of Galilee. Some people theorize that the author of John is really emphasizing John the Baptist's witness to the superiority of Jesus because there was a tendency in the early church to elevate John the Baptist over Jesus. And in fact, there are still some followers of a sect today that claim John the Baptist as God's light for the world and the divine redeemer. Of course, we also know that many of John the Baptist's followers did flock to Jesus. On the one hand, this of course would have been what John the Baptist wanted, or else all his work and teaching would have been in vain. The whole point of his life was to point others to Jesus. On the other hand, I wonder if Jesus showing up on the scene would have been a little bittersweet. Imagine for a minute that you are in John the Baptist's shoes, or while well, his sandals. Up until now, when, when, when Jesus showed up, John the Baptist had been a pretty big deal. He had been a pretty important part of the story so far, baptizing large crowds of people, preaching, telling people to repent, getting people ready for Jesus. He was getting all the attention, people were flocking to him, and people were speculating as to his identity. Was he the Messiah? Or Elijah? Maybe a prophet? Well, no, he wasn't any of those things, but he had been prophesied about in scripture by the prophet Isaiah, so that's pretty cool. But now Jesus was actually here, and John the Baptist had to step back and let Jesus take over. His disciples left him pretty abruptly, it seems, to follow Jesus. And John the Baptist was saying things like, I am not worthy. Jesus ranks ahead of me. He must increase, I must decrease. He's constantly having to tell people that he is not the Messiah. Surely, this must have been a bit of a letdown after having played so prominent a role. But does he sound down in the dumps when he proclaims that he is unworthy? No, because the point is not how unworthy John the Baptist is. The point is about how awesome God is. You can feel John's excitement as he joyfully proclaims that this Jesus is the person he has been testifying about. Jesus is here. John isn't thinking about himself. He is basking in the presence of Jesus. We, he, we see here that John experiences great joy in his humility and in recognizing where he stands in relation to Jesus. And it was because of this recognition of his place and his humility that he was able to point people to Jesus. If he had been upset at Jesus' arrival and just went off and sulked about it, his previous work in proclaiming the pending arrival of Jesus would have been in vain. Just like John the Baptist, our own humility can point people to Jesus. Now I want to talk for a minute about um, the difference between being unworthy and being worthless. Because sometimes um, Christians teach about how undeserving we are to receive God's grace and say that we only deserve his wrath. Despite our wretchedness, though, God gives us grace anyway. Some will quote Romans 3.23, 
all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, to show that we are all failures who deserve hell. But ripping verses out of context like that is harmful because, not only because it can make us feel like that, but it's just poor theology. There is also widespread belief in something called penal substitution atonement theory, which <clears throat> you've probably heard of even if you didn't know it by that name. It basically says that God poured out his wrath on Jesus instead of us. Jesus took the punishment that we deserved because, you know, we're all horrible sinners. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we don't sin. Of course we do. But this theology is problematic. And I like Brian Zand's response to this theory in his book, Sinners in the Hands of a Loving God. It's a little bit small, but I'm going to read it for you. So, um, In our scriptures and creeds, we confess that Christ died for our sins. But this does not mean we should interpret the cross according to an economic model where God had to gain the necessary capital to forgive sins through the vicious murder of his son. In the parable of the prodigal son, the father doesn't rush to the servant's quarters to beat a whipping boy and vent his anger before he can forgive his son. No, the father bears the loss and forgives his son from his treasury of inexhaustible love. He just forgives. There is no payment. The only wrath we find in the parable belongs to the Pharisee-like older brother, not the God-like father. Being wretched is not a characteristic of being human, but is a symptom of being out of sync with our purpose, which is to be in relationship with God. Just like when John the Baptist stated his unworthiness, the point is not how horrible and undeserving we are, but how awesome and grace-filled God is. And of course we don't deserve grace, because once we do something to earn grace, it is no longer grace. Grace, by definition, is unmerited and freely given. We should be leaping for joy that the God who created the universe loves us this much and offers us grace and relationship with him instead of just leaving us on our own. But even though Jesus doesn't want us to feel horrible about ourselves, we do need to recognize who we are in relationship to the Creator, for it is in doing so that we can live to our fullest potential as humans and experience the joy that comes from being in relationship with God. We wouldn't even be here if not for God, so obviously there's a hierarchy. It's God, then us. To get philosophical for a second, is it even possible for God to create something that is greater than himself, or is there something greater that God could create? It's a logical impossibility, so therefore, it's only logical that we um, are dependent on God. But this isn't restrictive. It actually gives us great freedom. Being humble and recognizing who we are before God actually enables us to be much more than we could be otherwise to live in joy and point others to Jesus. It's about right orientation. Knowing that we are unworthy is a gift because it points us to the one who is worthy of our total devotion and stops our focus on self and keeps us from being enslaved to things that are not healthy for us. Recognizing our dependence on God frees us from the struggle of trying to be enough on our own and fills us with a joy that then spills out into the world as we seek to follow the two most important commandments of loving God with all that we are and loving others as we love ourselves. So let's, joy, uh, let's follow the example of John the Baptist and joyfully proclaim Jesus to a world that so desperately needs to hear it. <clears throat>